Well, thank you all for coming. I know this is a, a, a busy week, and I know this is uh, what was done, as uh, Professor Bueller indicated, on a, on a very short uh, time frame. We discussed it at the, as he said, the senior dinner. I wanted to make clear that was uh, senior in the sense of graduating <laughs> senior from MIT, not me as a senior citizen, although that's certainly true as well. <laughs> So this uh, will be, uh, in a sense, uh, the first word on this Amtrak accident. This is not a scholarly presentation drawn from the literature. It's mostly drawn from news accounts and, and discussions I've had with other high-speed rail people. Um, and uh, I hope to present a sense of what's going on with respect to this this accident, this tragic accident with uh, with eight deaths and many injuries north of Philadelphia, and give you a sense of how things fit together. Uh, and as long as I have this this nice audience, uh, give you some sense of what what it means to think about an accident like this in a systems perspective, because I uh, I like to think about complex socio technical systems. And certainly this system, uh, Amtrak in the Northeast Corridor, is a, is a complex socio-technical system. Uh, and uh, we can illustrate some systems concepts resulting from it. So let me, uh, let me tell you what this talk is about. And in a moment, I will tell you what it is, uh, what it's not about. Um, of course, it's about the, the tragic Amtrak derailment of just a week ago today. Uh, on Monday, excuse me, Tuesday evening, May, May the 12th. Uh, so we're going to talk about that. Uh, we're going to try and talk about systems thinking applied to that derailment, thinking more broadly, maybe a little bit outside the box. Uh, but we also ought to consider what this talk is not about. So it's not about and it's not intended to be a, a rush to judgment about what actually happened and why, except in the most basic of, sen basic of senses. And uh, it's not about who is to blame for what's happened, uh, what, what, it, what happened on that, in that situation. The blame game is famous. Whenever we have an accident, p fingers get pointed all over the place. And we uh, are going to try and avoid the blame game. Uh, but at the same time, we will speculate about possible causes and what may have happened. But bear in mind, and I say this several times during the talk, we're simply speculating. We, we really don't know a whole lot of, uh, about what happened beyond the obvious physical evidence of a, of a train on the ground and people killed and injured. So to lead into this, uh, let me give you some what I call systems ideas. Uh, and there are uh, several we will introduce here that have relevance to this, to this Amtrak, Amtrak accident. Um, the first is something we call complex socio-technical systems, abbreviated CSS. A second is what we call nested complexity. Uh, and a third is what we call evaluative complexity. And all of these concepts, systems concepts, uh, are, uh, are interwound, if you will, uh, with, the, uh, with the Amtrak accident. So first, just to define each of these terms, complex socio-technical systems uh, are complex by definition, but in a particular sense, in the sense of a high degree of connectivity, everything's connected to everything else, uh, with a lot of feedback between components, often nonlinear feedback and very rapid feedback, and also are characterized by uncertainty. There's a lot more we don't know than what we do know about the way in which these systems operate. But further, there's a high degree of technological complexity the systems we're talking about uh, are, uh, in a technical sense, highly complex, and certainly trains fit that, uh, th that definition. But to get into the socio-technical aspect of it, 
the systems will have substantial and wide-ranging social impacts. They matter in society. They matter to the quality of life of people. They matter to economic development, to life safety, and so on and so forth. So that's the, uh, the first term defined. Nested complexity is, represents systems that are complex from a physical point of view and also institutionally complex in terms of the organizations that try to manage those complex, those complex physical systems. So we have a physical system. Uh, we typically study those with quantitative uh, techniques, quantitative principles, engineering models, economic models, and the like. Um, we have the institutional sphere surrounding them, uh, more qualitative in nature, uh, and more often more participatory. We have organizations, we have people that are relating to our technically complex system. And we have stakeholder evaluation and organizational analyses as ways in which we study the institutional sphere. And as, uh, as I've indicated, we have different methodologies for use on the physical system, uh, for studying the interaction between the institutional system or sphere and the physical system, and then within the uh, institutional sphere. These are all things that are important when we study complex socio-technical systems, and particularly the one we're talking about today. And then the third of the three definitions, we have evaluative complexity. And what I mean by this is that different stakeholders, people with different perspectives about the system, may have very different ways of measuring system performance. So railroads, in the particular example we're talking about here, have one way of measuring performance, but individual passengers may have a different way. Uh, the Federal Railroad Administration and USDOT may have uh, different ways as well, and so on and so forth. And this makes decision making difficult, and hence the term evaluative complexity, coming up with the ways of making decisions when you have all these different stakeholders with different perspectives uh, is, as we like to say at MIT, non-trivial. So those are the three definitions. Let's, let's do something a little more lighthearted about some of these rather heavy ideas. I have a few quotes for you. Uh, some of you have heard of Lawrence Peter, uh, if not by name, you've probably heard of the Peter Principle, which is the principle by which people advance within organizations to their highest level of incompetence, uh, which has the effect of freezing system performance. So this, this gentleman, Lawrence Peter, said some problems are so complex that you have to be highly intelligent and well-informed just to be undecided about them. Um, I had a more serious comment, although anecdotal, with a professor at Tsinghua University in Beijing, China. We were there uh, in a study group uh, uh, in 2007, the year before the Beijing Olympics, and a number of academics, both uh, on the U.S. side and the Chinese side, were together. And in what I thought was a very insightful remark, we were talking in this particular context of accessing downtown Beijing uh, from the airport uh, in Beijing, which turned out back then and probably still now to be a very difficult problem to solve. Uh, and we were talking about that particular problem, but he pointed out that to solve that one problem, congestion to the, from the airport to downtown, you have to solve 10. Everything is interconnected and it's very hard to, to pull out a particular portion of a system and simply study it. And then somebody who you might not associate with, with systems thinking, uh, Lady Bird Johnson, the widow of, of Lyndon Baines Johnson, the president back in the, uh, back in the 60s, uh, uh, in her, in her uh, obituary in The Economist magazine back in 2007, said that her, her first lady task was highway beautification. And what she said was, it's like picking up a tangled skein of wool. The threads are interwoven, recreation, pollution, mental health, crime rate, rapid transit, and so on and so forth. 
everything leads to something else. So th these are three ways of thinking about all the interconnections uh, that, we, uh, that we have to worry about when we deal with the systems that, we, that we're concerned with uh, in, uh, in transportation and many other areas as well. And finally, the, uh, the great uh, English novelist uh, E.M. Forster, uh, quoted by Peter Drucker, uh, a great management sage, would speak about only connect as his, as his admonition to everybody. The ability to connect and thus raise the yield of existing knowledge is learnable. And I think a lot of what's going on in civil and environmental engineering over the last several years relates to those ideas. We've, we've had a number of people come in to uh, interview for faculty positions and talk about various perspectives they have and I've been interested, and I know my colleagues have been interested to see the way in which many of these ideas, micro, macro questions, and a variety of others, cut across so many areas of interest in the, in the department. So connecting is always going to be important. So I've mentioned socio-technical systems uh, and complex socio-technical systems. And we are concerned in engineering uh, about designing those kinds of systems. It's a daunting task. Uh, we are not simply observers of those systems. We don't simply watch to see what happens, as one might do in many natural experiments. Uh, our complex socio-technical systems are pur purposeful. That is, we have ideas about what they ought to do to, uh, to contribute to, uh, to our society. So we have to have a normative view of those systems. What does good performance actually mean? How do we measure, define and measure that performance? And we have to have a prescriptive view. How do we make our system perform better? And I've given you kind of systems thinking in once over lightly terms, but hopefully you get some sort of an idea of what we're saying. Now, our complex socio-technical system is the Northeast Corridor. Uh, it uh, begins right here in Boston, goes uh, down through uh, the great metropolis of New York and ultimately to Washington, uh, connecting many cities along the way. Philadelphia is a large city that uh, is along the Northeast Corridor. Uh, Baltimore is another. Uh, it is the de most densely settled corridor in the United States. Uh, it is um, probably the economic engine or one of the major economic engines in the U.S. and one can argue in the world. So effectiveness and efficiency in transportation along this corridor is very important. Uh, we've been faced over the years with uh, congestion in the highway mode, congestion in the air mode, uh, Along that corridor, we have the most congested airports in the country are on the Northeast Corridor, uh, and uh, it affects the quality of service the air industry can provide. Highway, highway congestion, particularly near the major cities, uh, is, uh, is also uh, quite problematic. And we've been talking for many, many years about the effective role that rail transportation could play in this corridor, uh, particularly if one could provide a high quality of service, what we, uh, what we call high-speed rail, uh, which exists, excuse me, which exists in uh, many countries of the world, first and foremost Japan, who uh, implemented their first Shinkansen system in 1964, a modest 51 years ago. Uh, followed by France and Germany and Italy and uh, China now as a major player and systems in Korea, South Korea, uh, and uh, systems in Taiwan. The, the, uh, the uh, flow in that area is, uh, the momentum in that area is substantial. And the U.S. has been a laggard without any question in the provision of these kinds of, these kinds of systems. I will tell you, when I was here as a graduate student, uh, it, it was the year 1965, and I was in this graduate uh, large-scale project seminar with some 40 or 50 grad students from all over MIT uh, looking at large systems problems. And there were people from Civil and Sloan and the other engineering departments and so on and so forth. And guess what the topic was? It was 
high-speed ground transportation in the Northeast Corridor. Uh, and that's, uh, that's a mere 50 years ago. I still have the project. It was, it was nicely done. I learned a hell of a lot. Uh, it was nicely done. I have, uh, I have probably the last remaining copy of it on my bookshelf in my office. But it's really rather remarkable that now, 50 years on, we're still talking about high-speed ground transportation in the Northeast Corridor. Now, while there has been some progress, uh, we now have a cellar, we now have regional service. Certainly, uh, when one compares it with the uh, compares us with the rest of the world, it is it is modest indeed. So this is our complex socio-technical system, uh, and now I'll show you some photographs uh, of what happened to it. Uh, a week ago. Uh, these are photographs uh, uh, of, uh, uh, of the wreck, uh, the train, as many people know, and I'll go into it in more detail, went into a curve uh, about twice over the speed limit, 105 miles, 106 miles an hour, going into a 50 mile an hour curve, and uh, in fact derailed, spilling cars all over, all over the landscape. Uh, here's another another photograph. You get an idea of the extent of the damage. You have cars lying on their sides. Here's a more close-up view of uh, first responders, the firemen trying to get uh, people out. Uh, yet another picture of uh, of how uh, how scattered over the landscape these passenger cars were. And over on the left-hand side, you can see, lo and behold, freight trains. Uh, now, it's, it's very interesting, and it's interesting to, uh, to many analysts and, and students of the field of transportation, that while we lag, we, the U.S., lag in passenger transportation around the developing world, and now even in the developed, 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 developed world, excuse me, I got that backwards, uh, we are first in the world without any question in freight transportation so and by rail. So it's something to ponder why we can see, be so bad at passenger and so good at freight within, within the rail mode. It's, it's an interesting notion to ponder. Uh, here's an, yet another shot. Uh, these cars are on their sides. Uh, and in one case almost turned over, turned turtle, and getting people out of those cars, uh, particularly with impending fires, as people were concerned about, turned out to be uh, not so easy. And here's the final shot I'll have, which is just an idea of the Amtrak right-of-way uh, uh, going in the upper part of the diagram toward New York and the lower part toward, toward Washington. You have uh, a small schematic of uh, of the network and the crash site. You can get some idea of uh, of what was going on. I think you'll all agree that physically, it was a horrific accident. You just look at the mess on the ground, and uh, you can begin to understand its its magnitude. So let me talk. A bit about the basic, the basics of the accident. I'll report simply, more or less, what the facts of the case are. We'll get into some speculation further on. So we had a northbound regional train from Washington to New York City. This was on Tuesday evening. I say regional to distinguish between it and the so-called Acela Express which is a faster train that goes on the same, uh, goes on the same right of way. Regional is the next class down, uh, but we make that distinction. So north of Philadelphia, the train accelerates to 106 miles an hour as it goes into a curve with a speed limit of, of 50 miles an hour. So it's 100% uh, over speed uh, as it hits that curve. The engineer applies the emergency brake as they move into the curve, but it's way too little and way too late, and the train uh, delay uh, derails, spilling all those all those cars and people onto the ground. And as one would expect, the situation on the ground becomes uh, quite uh, quite chaotic with 
people milling around, stunned, badly hurt, and in some cases fatally hurt. Um, we continue with the basics of the accident. Uh, the first responders arrive, they do their best, and by all accounts, they seem to do pretty well in responding to this awful uh, accident. And that's, by the way, part of a complex socio-technical system. How does, how does society react in real time when these kinds of things happen? In this case, it was not the story because they apparently did pretty well. In other cases, it is the story because the response is, is not first rate. Uh, in terms of the impact, six people are declared dead at the scene right then and there. Uh, many are taken to various hospitals. An additional victim dies uh, uh, later that evening or in the morning. The next day, another victim is found in the wreckage who hadn't been fi found in the first, first pass through. It brings the overall uh, death toll to eight. So I'm going to take a deep breath and I'm going to sort of ask you to think about this. Given the discussion we've had so far, and given the photographs I showed you of these cars sprawled all over the place, and there was something in the order of about 250 or 300 people on this train, how does the number eight strike you? I mean, it's a terrible thing that eight people are killed, but how does that strike you? Is out, does that sound outlandishly high to you? or maybe outlandishly low to you? What would you think? I mean, if I told you this was an airplane crash, and you see photographs of airplanes that crash with debris all over the place, how many people would you think would have died in that case? Probably everybody on the plane, as uh, tons of aluminum fall from the sky at from 35,000 feet. You're talking about 100% uh, of the uh, people aboard being killed. So here, a little physics for you. Uh, we are not talking about something falling from 35,000 feet. We're talking about a train that's going fast uh, and ends up on the ground. But it's interesting that the numbers of people, the fraction of people on the train that were killed, uh, while tragic, of course, is a modest fraction of the number of people who are on the uh, on the train itself. So it's interesting that while eight fatalities is awful, if, if one looks at transportation accidents in other modes, it's, it's much more modest. Okay, continuing with the basics of the, uh, uh, of the accident. So the engineer uh, survives the crash. Uh, he's badly uh, concussed. Uh, and he basically says, I don't remember anything uh, after passing through the North Philadelphia station uh, in the northern part of Philadelphia, uh, which was about three miles from the derailment. So he's not remembering what, what, what took place. Uh, he doesn't remember accelerating to 106 miles an hour. Uh, and he doesn't uh, remember breaking the train having emergency brakes as they went into the curve and he realized what was what was going on apparently but he doesn't he doesn't remember it now this is not unusual in these kinds of cases where someone has been subjected to uh, tremendous amounts of uh, tremendous amounts of stress and possibly pain so this uh, is not off the charts unusual uh, we continue through the basics of the accident uh, Apparently, the train was hit by a uh, thrown rock from the wayside uh, shortly before the derailment. There's good physical evidence that that happened because there's a broken windshield that didn't happen as a result of the crash itself. Forensics show it was uh, uh, caused by some thrown projectile, uh, a, uh, uh, a rock in all likelihood. And this is apparently not very uncommon on this stretch of track in northern Philadelphia, uh, where it's a rough and ready neighborhood, if you will, on the outskirts of this city, uh, with a lot of homeless people and uh, people who <coughs> are, uh, are perhaps looking for trouble. So throwing rocks at trains maybe is something that they find, uh, they find uh, interesting to do. And indeed, these incidents in this in this part of the on this part of the railroad 
have been going on uh, for many, many years. In the early 20th century, the then president of the United States, Theodore Roosevelt, was in a train uh, uh, that was hit by just such a rock. Uh, they just kept on going. Uh, I'm guessing if such an incident happened uh, in modern day America, you've had 400 Secret Service a uh, agents combing, combing the area and trying to figure out what happened, but things were happen, things were done a bit more casually then. Um, there were several other trains in that geographical area uh, that also reported being hit by rocks. Uh, there was one SEPTA train, which is the commuter service in and around uh, Philadelphia, uh, and another regional train, but going going southbound, also hit it at that amount of time, at, at, during that same period of time. And engineers call this being, quote, rocked, close quote, and apparently it could be pretty distracting. There you are zipping along at 100 miles an hour or whatever it is, and all of a sudden some huge projectile hits your windshield or the side of your cab. It can be, uh, it can be a, little, a little unnerving. Um, but again, a disclaimer here, any, I'm, I'm not indicating uh, a connection between the rock incident, the fact that the rock hit the train, uh, <clears throat> and the derailment. Uh, Perhaps it did, perhaps it didn't. At this point, it's uh, purely, uh, purely speculative to make that connection. So now that we've moved into speculation, let me continue along those lines. So here are some speculations on the accident. Okay, I've got speculations. I should have put it in all caps. So tomorrow the Boston Globe doesn't report that Joe Sussman said that the accident was caused in such and such a way. Um, there's no reporters in the crowd, right? Nobody here, just, just MIT people. So here's something I gleaned from the newspaper, uh, the news, a recent uh, 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 newspaper report. So here's some speculation. Uh, when a train pulls out of North Philadelphia, the engineer usually twists the throttle, quote, uh, by a former train engineer up to notch eight, which is the most uh, powerful uh, throttle setting they have. And as this fellow says, that's engineer speak for wide open. That's as, as much power as you can, uh, as you can provide. And it's, it's kind of similar to you pulling out from a, uh, from a toll booth, let's say, on the main turnpike, and you want to get up to 70 miles an hour as quickly as you can. And the way you do that uh, is you provide quite a lot of power uh, to the engine to get up to speed, and then you would, then you would slow up. Uh, the throttle operates differently. It's not a foot pedal, but rather you physically push it up from notch one, barely moving, to notch eight, full power. Uh, so the, the physical mechanism is different. So this engineer goes on to say, uh, when you leave the throttle wide open until you get, uh, usually I should say, you leave the throttle wide open until you get up to 80 miles an hour, and then you put the brakes on for the curve. He's referring to the particular curve on, at which the derailment took place. So he says it seems reasonable that something happened right about that time. He is supposed to, the supposed to is my interpretation, start slowing down. Uh, that made him, uh, that kept him from taking, uh, taking the throttle off. He was perhaps startled by the impact of whatever, maybe this rock, and by the time he realized it, given he was a bit addled by the rock hitting the cab, he failed to uh, go uh, into a setting on the throttle that was less than wide open. Uh, what he realized what had happened, he was going too fast. He recognized that, he put on the brake, uh, but it, as I said, it was too little too late, and the person I'm quoting is a retired engineer who apparently had considerable experience on that, uh, particular, uh, on that particular segment of track. So that's a speculation. So let me give you another speculation, also from the press. So this is speculation on the accident too, and there are going to be two pieces of this, 2A and 2B. So the engineer, about 33 years old, uh, in the profile that the New York Times published about him, 
uh, uh, turned a lifeline, a lifetime passion for railroads into a career as a railroad engineer. Uh, and railroads uh, in this country and possibly abroad uh, uh, have a certain romantic panache about them. Uh, and you will, uh, you will see people who have uh, a deep interest in rail transportation, and particularly uh, back in the days of the steam engines, you'll, you can find collections of photographs of trains with plumes of white smoke coming, and it was the, the biggest, strongest part of our society for many, for many decades. So people fall in love with railroads, uh, and in fact, uh, Brandon uh, Bastian was one of those, and he has, he became what you might call a rail fan. So every Friday night, the New York Times reports in high school, Bastian and his friends would go down to the Memphis train station where he lived uh, to watch a famous train. It's, by the way, celebrated in a song, the city of New Orleans. I, perhaps some of you have, have heard that song. It's a folk song. It go, the, the, the train goes from Chicago down to New Orleans. Huh? Well, both ways it goes. But. Okay. Uh, uh, so they would uh, hang around the Memphis train station until until midnight, uh, and then go for burgers or dyers at Beale Street uh, Landmark. Now, sometimes when I happen to be here late on a Friday night, uh, I'll leave Building One and I'll see the graduate student offices are still full of people and I'll sometimes go in there and say, hey, it's Friday night, you know, you can stop working even though half of them are doing something I'd asked them to do. Uh, but, but, the, but I guess that's better than hanging out watching a train go by every Friday night. But that's, that's, a, matter of, uh, that's a matter of supposition. So he was a rail fan and apparently a very well-informed and serious one and uh, although he got a bachelor's degree in accounting. Uh, what he really wanted to do was drive trains, and that's in fact what he was doing. So now let's continue with the speculation from uh, quotes from the Daily Beast, perhaps not as authoritative as the New York Times, but nonetheless more or less uh, reputable. So in what they report, uh, they talk more about Mr. Bastian, the, the engineer, and they say that his prior train that day was a southbound train from Boston to Washington. Uh, in this case, it was the high quality train, the Acela Express 2121, uh, and that was his job immediately before he was going to take on the task of, of driving the uh, other train to the north. And this, uh, this train suffered what's called a cab signal failure. Uh, making that train especially that trip especially sp stressful for him, we speculate. It's, we're speculating it was it was stressful. We're not speculating about the cab cab signal failure. These trains have inside the cab they have signals that tell people the engineer what to do. You know, we're coming to a speed limit. We're coming to some uh, uh, some situation you ought to be aware of, and that failed. Uh, which put an awful lot of pressure on him because now you're sailing down the right of way and the only way you know that uh, something uh, in front of you uh, uh, bears, uh, bears scrutiny is you see a red light or you see a speed limit sign and normally these are displayed inside the cab uh, but for, for much of this trip from Boston down to Washington it was inoperable and he continued to to, uh, to drive the train under those conditions, and we speculate it was stressful for him. Um, so in addition, unsurprisingly, train 2121 was a half hour late. That's hardly unusual. Uh, so he had only 51 minutes, given the lateness of the arrival in Washington, uh, before his next assignment, which turned out to be the ill-fated northbound regional train. And usually 90 minutes are, of rest are expected. Uh, and the agreement uh, between Amtrak and its engineers is only informal. This is not something that's chiseled into stone that says there will be 90 minutes between the time 
that you uh, that you arrive at uh, in Washington for one assignment and take on your next assignment. I'm guessing some of you have been involved in airline delays where everyone's all set to go and all of a sudden the crew times out. They can't fly because they have been flying for too many hours that day or whatever it may be. And those rules are not informal. Those rules are written down and heavily regulated by the federal government. Uh, and the crew simply won't fly. Uh, in this case, uh, informally, it's 90 minutes, but he only had 51, and what the hell, let the guy drive the train. In principle, he could have called the dispatcher and said, I'm not doing too well. That was a rough trip down. There's no evidence he made that call. And if he made the call, perhaps he was told, suck it up and drive the train. You know, this is a railroad after all. Uh, so uh, he gets into that train. Uh, according to another engineer that the Daily Beast uh, interviewed, he would have been, quote, frazzled from the southbound trip. So he's, let's speculate, not in particularly good shape at this point. He's had a long day with a train limping along. Uh, he brought it in a half hour late, which isn't too good from, from his perspective. So uh, that's, uh, that's where we are. He's frazzled from the southbound trip. He's going now north. And then a rock hits the cab at this crucial moment when he ought to be throttling down. Uh, and uh, he gets distracted and he doesn't throttle down and he keeps going into this term, into this, into this curve at 106 miles an hour. And the next thing he knows, the train is on the ground. So this is a speculation and a speculation on top of a speculation, but at least to a first approximation, you know, maybe something like this happened. We really don't know. Uh, maybe someday we will, or maybe we won't. But it's worth commenting that the first reaction in any of these situations is to blame the operator, blame the train engineer. I mean, how could that idiot go into that turn at 106 miles an hour? What was he, nuts? Uh, blame the airline pilot. It seems it's hard to find airline accidents that aren't the pilot's fault. Uh, blame the nuclear power plant operator. Gee, they should have known to turn this valve uh, in, the, uh, in, the correct, uh, in the correct direction. And maybe blaming the operator is partially or even fully correct in some situations, uh, but often the situation is much more complex than that. Uh, and your first reaction may be very, very wrong, uh, or at least incomplete in terms of explaining, uh, explaining what happened. So let's think about this a little bit more. So let's think about why did the train accelerate to a velocity of 106 miles an hour, 50% higher than the speed limit going into uh, a 50 mile an hour curve. Why do you do that? Uh, so the first explanation is the one I just gave. We had a frazzled, addled driver from his southbound trip who gets hit by a rock at exactly the wrong second. And all of a sudden the train is on the ground and a, and a day later you have you have eight deaths. So can anybody, while I catch my breath and take another swig of water, uh, can anybody speculate on some other possible reasons that this happened? Let's suppose the Sussman hypothesis is totally <laughs> off base. What other things plausibly could, could we have here? And we have some people in this room who drive trains in Japan and other, other places, so someone could tell us Maybe what's really going on. So who's got, who's got, I've got, let's see, I've got one, two, I got another four plausible explanations for what could have happened. Uh, the above, the frazzle driver and the rock, uh, which might or might not be the driver's fault, but that's, that's one track you could take. Anybody else have any ideas? Some of my rail people ought to be able to come up with something just to keep the ball rolling, right? No? Yeah, go ahead, Tatsu. Uh, one possible problem should be possibly like there was no system to automatically have a brain on the train, even when the speed is limited. Right, so you've got 
a different kind of an error altogether that could have taken place. Uh, it is the, uh, the fact that there is technology that stop trains when they're going too fast. Uh, there are several levels of these technologies. The most sophisticated is called positive train control. Uh, in fact, it's been mandated by the United States Congress to be in place on the entire network of the United States at the end of 2015. And so far they have something like 8,000 miles of 60,000 so equipped. You think maybe they're not going to make that deadline? I'm kind of thinking that's right. So yes, there's the absence of technology that could have helped. That was my last choice. Yeah, Pat. An uh, alternative explanation is that the problem is not the driver going too fast, but the curve being too slow. That they have these mixing speed limits along the route, and that that's so you are speculating. You are suggesting that the error was in design of the infrastructure that's only been there since 1890 or something like that, uh, and that that curve should have been eliminated. In fact, uh, I heard Joe Boardman on the radio driving in this morning say, you know, if that train had only been going 80 rather than 106, nothing would have happened. You would have had kind of a squeal going around the turn, but you certainly wouldn't have had a derailment. So there is a factor of safety built in there. If you go 60 rather than 50, you're not going to put the train on the ground. But you go double, you probably are. Any other uh, speculations? That's not one I had. That's an interesting one. Go ahead, Joanna. Um, you can tell that since I know everyone's name who I'm calling on that we're not getting much of an outside representation. <laughs> I'm good at remembering names, but there are a lot of people in this room who I don't think I've ever seen before. Go ahead. Um, Amtrak's timetables could be putting too much pressure on drivers to make up speed in certain sections where it's not appropriate. Right. So having too wide open your throttle could be a, a factor of not having a good section time, and so the engineer feeling like he really needs to push the speed of the train. Is not yeah, and this guy was already a half hour late in the morning getting down to Washington. Does he want to be late yet again? So he's thinking about on-time performance. There was an accident in... Japan, I don't know, one of my Japanese friends can help me, uh, uh, maybe 10 years ago now, uh, it, was in an, it was in an urban area, I forget which, it wasn't Tokyo, Kobe, and this very relatively young, young, inexperienced driver was running behind, and he obviously had been chastised about doing that in the past, and he went into a curve in the middle of a city in this case, uh, over his head and ended up with the train on the ground. So that kind of thing could happen even in probably the safest rail nation in the world, Japan. So yeah, having that kind of pressure. Any others? Go ahead. Um, well, not unlike the pilot who took down the plane recently, is a possibility, purely speculative, that this is somebody who wanted to, to crash the train. Someone who was doing suicide by train, yeah. right. So That's one of the ones on my list. Good. Or, and then the other thing that I think has been floated in, implicitly in the suggestion that it was hit by either a rock or gunfire is the possibility. I think, I think they're suggesting that maybe this was a terrorist attack. I hadn't seen that. But, but, the, but the fact that they said maybe a rifle, a, a gun, like a, a bullet. Yeah, I hadn't seen speculation that it was anything other than some the, the, rowdy guy throwing a rock. Ah, interesting. I hadn't heard that. Okay, good. Uh, it's not clear that the uh, engineer would distinguish between those two, but yeah, that's a possibility. So let me give you mine. Uh, one is a mechanical failure. Uh, he puts the throttle into eight position and it gets stuck and he can't pull it back and the train just continues on. That's that is that is plausible. Uh, you occasionally hear of an accident on on uh, in automobiles where somebody puts the accelerator to the floor, takes their foot off the accelerator, and the car just keeps right on going. So it's not uh, totally implausible. So mechanical failure is possible. There doesn't seem to be any evidence of that. Uh, what what you just uh, you just said uh, a perf a purposeful act by the engineer like the German Wings co-pilot recently who went smashing into into uh, the French Alps killing himself and everybody uh, else uh, else on board that certainly 
a possibility. Uh, he wasn't very successful, obviously, since he continues to, to live, and uh, so that didn't work. How about someone hacks into the train's electronics uh, and takes control of the train? There's recently been this business about some hacker getting into an airplane's electronics through the at-the-seat uh, entertainment centers and presumably taking control of the plane. Whether that's true or not is hard to say, but, I mean, it's conceivable. Uh, or finally, what, what Tatsu said at the very beginning, technology to prevent overspeeding was not in place. So there's this, uh, there's this big strategic mistake made by the rail industry. Uh, Patton had another example saying, the curves are too sharp, why don't we straighten them? The other, uh, Tatsu was saying, why don't we have technology in place that exists all over the, all over the world uh, to prevent overspeeding? If we had had that, we wouldn't have had the, uh, had the, had the accident. So those are some alternative uh, explanations. Uh, can technology help avoid future accidents? Things like positive train control, uh, systems that will stop a train if it's going over speed? The short answer is yes. Uh, but nothing is guaranteed. I mean, things, things can go wrong uh, uh, with, the, with the technology. Earlier today, Patton sent me uh, a wiki, uh, uh, not a wiki, a uh, whatever you call those things that give you information about things you want to know about. Uh, <laughs> like, like in this case, in this case, the fact that WMATA, the Washington Metro System, has technology to do this uh, but has turned it off since 2009, since they believe some accidents on the system were caused by malfunctions of that technology. So nothing is guaranteed in this world. So May 19th, 2015, some of you will note that that is today. Uh, I have, I've gotten in the, in the habit over many years of when I'm giving a talk, uh, just about anywhere, uh, I always try and get a look at the morning paper because you'd be amazed at how often there's something in the morning paper that relates to your uh, relates to your theme, and it's a very nice way to connect with the audience. I remember back in the mid '90s, uh, several MIT professors and I were doing a project in Bangkok, Thailand, one of the most congested cities in the world, and. Uh, there were various topics, but I was speaking about congestion and congestion control. And the uh, uh, I opened up the Bangkok Times this mor that morning, and lo and behold, on the front page, there was this article about congestion in Bangkok. So I very proudly wove it into my text, uh, only to discover that the whole week we were there, congestion and its problems were on the front page of the Bangkok Times every day. So it was hardly, hardly just good luck that allowed me to find that article. But anyway, this was good luck in the New York Times, which I like to check in the morning. So here are a couple of quotes from, from, from the article. Uh, Nearly seven years after Congress instructed the nation's railroads to install an automatic speed control system by the end of this year, the crash of the speeding Amtrak train last week has laid bare the industry hurdles, regional rivalries, and often dismal economics of rail safety. So what are they saying there? Basically what they're saying is the freight railroads, which has an overwhelming fraction of the trackage in this country, don't want to really spend the money to do this, and they will fight it every step of the way. Uh, it's expensive. It's in the order of 60, 70, 80 billion dollars nationally. Uh, and they don't see the arithmetic working. Uh, they don't see uh, that the occasional accident matches up effectively if one is doing a benefit cost analysis. I have a couple of my undergraduates here who had to hear me talk about benefit cost analysis for the last four months. Uh, they don't see the benefit cost analysis doing, doing anything for them. Spending all that money, and every five years, eight people get killed in Philadelphia? Well, doesn't sound like the math works, uh, especially if I'm running systems out there in the middle of Wyoming, uh, where even if the train does go off the track with, with coal in it, 
you're not going to kill anybody probably. So what's the big deal? So you have uh, uh, all these all these institutional hurdles uh, that prevent uh, consensus from building around this idea, even though it is a law of the land. Uh, Congress is currently deciding uh, how by how far they will extend this deadline uh, with the uh, safety people saying, how about a year and a half? Uh, and the Association of American Railroads and the congressmen and senators from states that are railroad oriented are saying, how about 2020? Uh, so it's, uh, it continues to be a battle. More on that, uh, on that same, from that same article. There's a relatively straightforward kind of technology called automatic speed control. All it does is slow you down if you go into a stretch of road uh, too fast. And in fact, part of uh, the Northeast corridor that Amtrak operates has automatic speed control. In the southbound tracks, immediately parallel to the northbound tracks, they do have automatic speed control, but they haven't quite gotten around to automatic speed control on the northbound track since hence this accident, uh, and a more um, uh, uh, sophisticated, I guess is the word, kind of technology is positive contra- te- train control. Uh, as I indicated earlier, it's been posted, uh, installed on about 8,000 of 60,000 miles of track. They've spent $5 billion to, to, to date. You can do the math and see what it would cost to equip the entire system. It's a system based on GPS, and it does all sorts of things. Overspeeding trains it will control. Uh, it helps you avoid head-on collisions, which is viewed as very bad form in the railroad industry. Uh, obstacles on the tracks can be sensed, such as vehicles at grade crossings. Occasionally you hear of a horrific accident. Back about 20 years ago, there was a situation in the suburbs of Chicago where a high school a high school bus got somehow caught on the tracks and a train came along and killed half the kids on the bus, uh, which uh, uh, gave a lot of uh, celebrity to that particular situation. Uh, a switch can be in a wrong or a misaligned condition. You've seen switches on rail tracks, you want to go to the left, you want to go to the right. Uh, If the switch is improperly positioned, it'll tell you, uh, or an incursion into a work zone. So positive train control can do a lot of things. Uh, Is it foolproof? We don't know, but certainly it would uh, be a step in the right direction. There are issues with positive train control. There's interoperability. Uh, This is a big country with a lot of different railroad companies that operate on it. Amtrak as a passenger carrier is but one, uh, but there are many freight railroads, big and small, around this nation, and the equipment has to work consistently on the network as a whole for it to be effective. So interoperability is a critical issue. Something as mundane as the placements of antennas on the wayside because these uh, uh, use Wi-Fi type technologies and people get remarkably upset about antennas in their uh, in their area. Uh, spectrum availability is another issue. Uh, everybody's always fighting about frequency and who gets who gets what. Uh, in the ITS work where I've uh, uh, also done a fair amount of work, that's been a, uh, a cutthroat debate in that industry. Who is going to get the, the following frequencies? And people fight very hard about it. Uh, and then we have complexity. Uh, maybe we have some of the people from the transit group here, and they've probably heard of uh, APTA, the American Public, Tr- Public Transportation Association, and their president, uh, Michael Milan Uh And he was quoted in the same article as saying you can't just walk down to the railroad store like the Apple store and pick up 50 50, uh, pieces of the technology and stick them on the train and go. This is very complex new technology. It's not as easy uh, as it looks. Okay, so that gives you a a kind of a once over lightly sense. Uh, And I wanted to close by giving, giving you guys a chance maybe to sound off on a few things. And I'll also take some questions. So here's a question for discussion. Uh, 
Suppose you are an advocate for international quality high-speed rail in the United States, uh, especially in the Northeast Corridor. So by international quality, the way we use that term in my group, we're talking about Shinkansen in Japan, uh, TGV in, uh, in France, and other, uh, other comparable technologies. So you're an advocate. You'd like to see it happen. You've done the math. You think it's a real good idea for the United States of America, uh, in the Northeast Corridor especially, but in other corridors also, California, Florida, uh, in the Chicago area. You're an advocate. You'd like to see it happen. You believe it's the best thing uh, for, this, for this country. So putting aside the human tragedy part of this, no one's happy that six people got, uh, eight people got killed, uh, and many uh, injured perhaps seriously. If you're an advocate, is this crash good or bad news for you? You know, your wife wakes you up at 11 o'clock at night and said, Joe, there's just been this massive crash on the Northeast car, eight, six people killed, turns out to be eight. Isn't that awful for the Northeast car and the work you're doing? Well. Is it awful? What do you think? Now, someone's got to say, are you kidding? Of course it's awful. How could you possibly suggest otherwise? But maybe it's not so awful. Anyone have any, any ideas one way or the other on that? Yeah, go ahead, Joanna. All right. Well, I know that my feeling after the crash was as horrendous as it was, it could be an impetus for change. And I have to say that I was dismayed to hear that it was an overspeeding accident and not an issue with infrastructure, mm -hmm. given that, yes, positive train control could have helped this, and it's, but it's a huge expenditure. And when you're looking at the Northeast Corridor, there's something like $60 billion in backlog of maintenance that also is a huge issue, and that this has sort of steered the discussion away from that issue. Um, and so is it good news or bad news? I haven't I quite gotten to the punchline. So it's bad news for the, the for the high speed the rail crash. advocate, huh? I would say the cause of the crash. It's bad news in the back. I guess it could also be good news. Oh, it's Wesley. He got a haircut <laughs> since the class has ended. It could also be good news because like uh, senators and stuff could see this, see this and be like, oh, this is they, there's all this media attention. They could be like, oh, we need to divert more money towards uh, spending on rail. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's no question that railroads are all of a sudden in the public eye. You're getting Amtrak on the front page day after day, and it'll probably continue for a little while. So attention is there. So you're saying it might, uh, it, it, when, when people talk about institutions, they talk about unfreezing opportunities that happen from time to time because of these massive events. And all of a sudden, positions that were rigid with people with their heels in the ground will say, gee, we, maybe we really ought to think about this a little more creatively. So you get some opportunity for a month, a year, for some institutional motion that you couldn't, couldn't get. So Wesley's saying it's a good idea. Joanna's saying it's not. Uh, I'm just worried that events serve to, as a, as a tool for existing interests. So optimistic story of Congress will think, oh yes, rail. Congress has a long interest in shutting down Amtrak and getting its service. So this is the feeds into that area. So you're saying it's a bad thing that this happened. Okay. Any others? Yes, sir. So I think Congress just cut one budget from Amtrak. Yeah. Million dollars of the accident. Yeah. I I don't think it would make a big impact in the long term. I think it's it, you know, it's not a good news, it's just something that it's just news. I've been using it, it's just news. Mm -hmm. it's just, yeah. So no big deal one way or the other. Yeah. That's certainly that's certainly reasonable. Yeah, Tolu. Well following up of that idea of the, the same, you know, the same Congress calling the budget in the same day, you know, it could um, point and say, you know, well maybe Congress should be cutting the budget because that's why, you know, <coughs> that those are part of the issues that Amtrak has and Congress really needs to pay more attention. You know, eight people died, eight people died. Um, so following going up of that, I would say it is 
sort of good news because it's drawing the attention to okay, Amtrak, funding, money, Congress, activists, you know, all of this. Um, so, good news. So, so <laughs> I'm not quite sure I'd come down on it. I can argue it either way equally eloquently. But, the, uh, but my sense is maybe it's good news. Maybe people look at this and say, look, we've got to fix this. Uh, we've got to have positive train control and have these accidents happening, which wouldn't happen in France or Germany or Japan in exactly the same situation. Uh, Although we did have one very much like this in Spain a couple of years ago, uh, some may some may remember, uh, almost precisely the same, and perhaps even more on the uh, in people's minds because it was caught on video on a security camera, and you see this train coming around the turn, and all of a sudden it's on the ground. All we had to show here today was still pictures, but. Uh, you could imagine the thinking going, we have to fix this. This is, this is pretty serious. So let's start thinking in a more high-tech way. And now that we have to do this, maybe it really makes sense to think about making the system uh, more advanced. As long as we're doing it, let's do it right. And let's start spending the kinds of money that would be necessary to uh, create truly a world-class kind of system at least in, a, in the most uh, high profile, densely set, uh, settled, high economic performance portion of the country. So you could, you could make a case in, in either direction. Yeah, Sam, do you have a hand up? Yeah, well, it doesn't seem like the reaction, it tends to be the reaction, and the positive training control came out of a, another accident back in 2008 that didn't spur any investment in rail besides trying to patch up the accident mm -hmm. or what caused the accident. Could be, could be. Daniel in the back. On a different scale, but though here. You're always in the back of the room, and I always have to walk up to half the room to hear you. Go ahead. Uh, on a different scale, but still here, the reaction to the uh, poor performance of the tea during the winter was completely opposite. It was we should not fund this until they figure some other stuff out. Right. We're not going to increase taxes, we're not going to increase funding. This is a failing system, so we shouldn't invest. Well, yeah, that's, that's certainly uh, a reasonable parallel. Uh, a blue ribbon committee, in, including people like Professor Tony Gomez Ibanez from the Kennedy School and others, uh, uh, came out with a very hard hitting report about what has to be done to reorganize the T, and it's going nowhere. Because the legislature said, oh, come on, we're not going to privatize. Are you kidding me? I got, you know, Ten, I've got thousands of people in my district to work for the MBTA. I'm going to privatize? Are you nuts? So it's so far going going nowhere, and the governor is frustrated. And who who will see what happens? There was another, yeah, and then you. I just think that there are a lot of other infrastructures, you know, ports, bridges, rail, highways. I mean, they need uh, renovation, a technological events. I mean, what would make Amtrak as a priority? in terms of public opinion and the Congress. An excellent point. Uh, we're not, I don't know if anybody had, had the time probably not to watch 60 Minutes this past Sunday night, but they had this big story on, on infrastructure and the fact we're not investing in it. And we've got all these bridges that are about to fall into the water. Uh, and how are we going to get the money to spend it? And the Democrats want to do it and the Republicans want to do it. And uh, the head of the Chamber of Commerce, a very conservative, business-oriented organization, wants to do it. Sitting next to him in a congressional hearing was the president of the AFL-CIO, the labor union. They're both saying, "You got to do this. You got to do this." And somehow we can't figure. We everyone says yes, we have to do it, but no one will agree on how to pay for it. But so this is a piece of the whole infrastructure. Uh, disinvestment that's taking place. There's no no question about it. Yeah, go ahead. First, about the MBTA. I mean, you can call it a hard-hitting report, but the headline from it was, you know, there needs to be a fiscal control. There, there needs to be a fiscal control board so that the diagnosis of the problem wasn't that it couldn't move people from place to place, but that right. the spending was out of control. Right. So I don't think that actually talks to the issue. Second, Positive train control on the Northeast Corridor is said to have been fixed since this accident. Um, 
specifically what was holding it up was the spectral allocation issues, and the chair of the FCC happened to be testifying in Congress the morning of the accident about the FCC's you know, unwillingness to give up spectrum um, for this. The accident happened, and then the next day, suddenly the FCC gave up the spectrum. So it, as soon as- Unfreezing, yeah. Right. But you you still got to get it installed. But yes, that's an excellent point. Yeah. Yeah. Um, basically, basically I, I don't think it's a good news. But um, but still, we could uh, we could argue. But so okay. So if it's difficult to fix uh, fix the existing system, railway system, why don't we create a new totally new system dedicated for the highway railway system? Mm -hmm. the railway system. Way side system. Yeah. I'm sorry. Was there a question there? I didn't get the question. Okay, there wasn't a question mark at the end of any of those sentences, so I don't have to respond. We got some others. Yeah, I show you. Is it okay to sort of expand this beyond the specific question, or do you still want to stay with this? Oh no, I'm uh, I'm wide open. I'm, okay. ama I'm amazed people are still sitting here. Okay. Well, first of all, I made a mistake. Um, the, the schedule for the city of New Orleans also includes something called the Illini. I thought the Illini was what they call the one heading south, yeah. but in fact, in both directions, there is a city of New Orleans. But the, the one Does anyone in this room, other than this <laughs> gent and me, have ever heard the song, The City of New Orleans? Yes. It's a very famous folk but song. It is, the, it is the one that leaves New Orleans and arrives in Memphis, heading north, that gets into Memphis around 10 o'clock. I've actually taken that train. Oh, okay. It is a couple blocks from Beale Street, and not everybody may know that Beale Street is the famous blues. Center in Memphis. B. Right, we just had B.B. King, King, the rock guy, uh, the, the booze king, uh, just but, died. But getting back to the, to the safety, the positive train control, a few days ago I went online to the lobbying organization for the railroad companies, the Association of American Railroads that yeah. you mentioned, and found a, a, a background paper that was posted at their website on positive train control. But if you go to their page now, and click on the PDF for positive train control. It says the page you're looking for doesn't exist, which I think is actually quite alarming. That a paper that was available just a few days ago at the Trade Association's website has now been removed, where they lay out what their position is on delaying implementation of positive train control. So, my first, could you comment on that? Right. And could you comment on how much? How this much is, sense do you think there is to this argument that we can't afford it? I mean, this is this is evaluative complexity. The the freight railroads don't see it the way people who ride the trains as passengers might. Uh, when, when they do the calculations of uh, of uh, matching up sixty billion dollars against you know a bad accident every five years or so, it just doesn't the math doesn't work for them and. Uh, uh, and the, as I indicated, the 2015 is off the table. Now it's a question of whether it'll be 2020 or 2017, or even as soon as 2017. It's a, it's, uh, it's, it's a question of deciding what system performance means. What does system performance well, mean? Break it up so that they, they focus on passenger rail in, 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 in the heavily uh, traveled areas like the Northeast Corridor. I mean, my understanding is positive train control has been implemented between Boston and New Haven, but not yet the entire. But the, the but the problem is the only the only substantial piece of right of way that isn't owned by the freight railroads is the Northeast Corridor. Yeah. So if you move outside the Northeast Corridor, unless you're building brand new infrastructure from Chicago uh, to Urbana-Champaign to St. Louis, you're going to be operating on the right of way of a freight railroad. I think uh, we're going to uh, we're going to call it a day. Everybody is politely sitting there. I'll I'll take any any further questions offline. I really appreciate so many people coming to to uh, hear what we uh, what we had to say. Thank you. Yeah.